we are alive. On this chapter, we're going to try to understand the issue of pollution. So let me begin very simple and ask you a question. What do you think pollution takes place? Like the factories? Yeah, why does pollution take place? Carelessness. Okay, from who? The people who own those companies. The, the, okay, the people, okay. What else? Do we all want clean environment? Of course we do. Do we have the technology to be able to reduce pollution to zero? What do you think? No, not zero. Okay. Actually, we do have the technology to reduce pollution to zero. We have the technology, we have the method, we have the know-how to do it. Okay. Have you been following the news, for example, what has happened worldwide as a result of these stay-at-home orders, in which for the first time in places like China and Beijing, people can actually see the sky? You know, in places in India now, people can actually walk out without having to have wear a mask, right? I mean, pollution has decreased dramatically. I believe that in, in four weeks of not driving as much, pollution worldwide went by 20%. I mean, it is incredibly what, you know, a couple of weeks without not driving, you know, uh, we will be able to clean the environment. We do have the technology to actually clear the environment. We have machines that we have created in which the intake, I'm sorry, the, the exhaust, the exhaust is actually cleaner than the intake. In other words, we have an engine that we can put on an automobile that when you drive it down the street, the car is burning gasoline, but the exhaust is actually putting uh, water droplets outside. So we have the technology. The question is, if we have the technology, then why we do not implement that technology? And the answer is because the technology is too expensive. Nobody can afford to pay a $350,000 engine to put in your car, to pay for a $350,000 engine to put in your car, right? So then, as you can see, then pollution is actually a choice that we have decided to make. And the reality is that pollution takes place because pollution is a byproduct of production. See, the more we produce, the more waste we're going to have. Either we don't cut the things the right way, and we're going to have some raw material, some waste that we're going to have to throw, or simply we're going to have to burn some type of fuels to be able to put the machines in operation and we're going to create some pollution. So then pollution is a byproduct of economic growth. Right? So then the question is, are we willing to pay the price to reduce pollution at the expenses of a decrease in economic growth? And the answer is not many nations want to do that. They believe that the cost is too expensive. That's why, for example, uh, during this uh, president that we have now, the administration, right, we have got out of some pollution agreements. Uh, for example, there was an agreement that was taking place in Japan, at Kyoto, and 146 nations met to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. This is an agreement that nations have agreed in which they were going to agree to reduce pollution to the way it used to be back to the 1980s. It was reduced pollution by a couple of percentage. Uh, during the Obama administration, they have agreed to do that, and all the nations begin to work out, and they decide to go ahead and meet, I think it was about three years ago, four years ago, in, in uh, Kyoto, Japan, and all the nations of the world met, with the exception of three nations that decide not to sign the agreement. Okay, would you like to guess which nation decide not to sign the agreement? North Korea, Venezuela, in the United States. Now think about this, the most powerful nation of the world decided not to sign the agreement. And the reason was because Trump, the administration simply say, we are not going to allow to have other nations tell us how much pollution we can put into the, into the environment. If we want to reduce pollution, we're gonna do it in our own, you know, in our own time, in our own time frame, not on somebody else's frame. So, we're not going to sign that. Besides that, it's too expensive because we will have to reduce production. And at this point, we want to create more jobs. So we are not going to do it. Okay, so as you can see, pollution takes place simply because people do not own the environment. 
Now, and if you don't own the environment, you are not going to protect it. You don't care about somebody else's properties. Look at this. This is a little bit of a joke, but this will illustrate my point. Let's assume that I'm in my way from work and on my way from home, you know, I see Nathaniel in an empty lot. We have an empty lot here next to my house. And I see Nathaniel right there and he's pooping in that yard. And then I stopped the car and I told my wife, hey, look, look at that guy, I think he's one of my students. Oh yeah, that's, that's the guy that was took in the economics with me last semester. Yeah, I think his name is Nathaniel. I mean, Nathaniel pooped his pants and down and boom, he's pooping in the yard. I mean, man, this guy is crazy. I mean, this guy is crazy and I just laughed. Came home. The next day, in my way to the house, boom, there's Nathaniel again, throwing a crap. I mean, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, what's wrong with this guy? I laugh a little bit and, you know, the third day, the same story, I told my wife, man, I, I, I think this guy is crazy. I mean, three days and he's pooping in that yard every time. I mean, he has like a clock, you know, 520, 520, 520, he's pooping in that yard. So I just laugh, no big deal. Now the fourth day, I'm on my way to my house and now he's crapping, but he's crapping now in my yard. Am I going to laugh? <laughs> and the answer is no. We're gonna have a conversation with a bat, right? And say, clean your stupid crap and take it someplace else. You're not gonna do that in my house. So what was the difference? Well, that the three days before he was crapping across the street. It was not my property. But once he crap in my yard, then it becomes my property, and now I'm going to defend my property. So if we want to stop pollution, think about this. If we want to stop pollution from an economic point of view, it is very simple. You just have to assign rights. Give the rights to someone, for someone to decide if they're going to accept it or not accept it. Look, let me, let me, let me use another, another example so you can understand how this works. Um, okay. okay, look at this. Uh, for some reason, let's see if we can do it again. Okay. This is a highway, and in the other side of the highway, you know, this is the way cars are driving. In this side of the highway, there's a beautiful mountain. I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous mountains in the other side of the highway, right? An individual drives through that highway, and then he realizes that's a beautiful, beautiful place to operate. So he decides to purchase this land across the land, you know, and he opens a plant. It's a pharmaceutical company. He wants to have his company outside the city, right in these gorgeous mountain views. And everything is good. A couple of months later, another company purchased the property across the street. And this company is a mining company. And then they discovered that there's actually some type of minerals in the mountains. So they asked for license from the government and now they're going to go to try to extract those minerals. It's a mining company. So they decide to take these minerals by explosives. They begin to put explosives in the mountains and every time the explosives you know, take place, the company, the other side of the street is having a problem because their machines, you know, instead of staying calibrated, they become dis discalibrated. In other words, they have to make some minor adjustments because the machine vibrates. So this guy is really upset and he goes to the owner of the mining company and say, hey, you have to stop that because it is very, it just, my companies cannot operate like this. We're making, you know, precision drugs and the machine cannot have any, any variations. The guy over here is going to respond to him and say, hey, you look like you have a problem. If you don't like it, you can move. And this guy said, well, I cannot move because I was here first. <laughs> and what difference does it make? I purchased the land across the street and I have a permission to go ahead and do the mining. If you don't like it, you can move. Now the question is, who has the right? Who has the right? Right, and as you can see, we don't know. So, but look what happened if we are some rights. Let's assume that this guy in the company, to be able 
to, to be able to, to continue operating right there, he has to buy a new machine that is able to withstand vibrations. And that machine costs $2 million. Or he has a choice of moving to another place and that relocation is going to cost him $5 million. Okay, so this is the option. You buy a new machine or you move to another place. If you were the owner of this company, what would you do? Would you pay the two million or the five million? Of course, you will pay the two million and buy a new machine. Right? Now, look at this. How about if we allocate rights? Doesn't really matter to who. Let's allocate the rights to the pharmaceutical company. The pharmaceutical company comes to this guy and say, you are causing some problems for me. This is the situation. Either you write me a check for $2 million so I can buy a new machine, you move, and stop the excavation, or you give me $5 million to move to another place. Well, this company cannot move because they're extracting minerals from there. So then the only choice for the company is pay the two million or the five million. Guess what the, the, the mining company is going to do? Of course, it's going to pay the two million dollars. It's cheaper for them. How about if we assign the rights to the mining company? If we assign the rights to the mining company, the same thing. The owner of the company is going to pay the two million dollars. Which this example is illustrating is a very simple concept that once we assign rights to someone, the optimal, the best method is always going to be implemented. Right? So, in other words, we assign rights, we'll be able to find a solution. Now, what type of pollution do we have? As you already know, there's a different types of pollutions. There are a lot of different types of pollution. So, let me go ahead and begin the lecture right here. Uh, let me see if I can get it right here. Okay. As you already know, everyone wants a cleaner and safer environment. If everybody wants this type of clean environment, the question is why we just don't stop polluting? Why? does not the government just force us to stop polluting right and the answer is because all these choices have a cost involved so in order to try to understand what an economist have to say about pollution we need to be able to understand exactly you know what will happen if we regulate pollution and what will happen if we don't regulate pollution now what is the cost of pollution now think about this when pollution takes place Pollution is creating an external cost. An external cost. Uh, and the way to explain this, it will be something like this. Think about, for example, a company. This company is producing, I don't know, it's producing tires. This guy over here needs tires for his cars. He goes to the company. The company spent $300 in the production of those tires. They're gonna make $100 in profits. So they're going to set, sell the set of tires for $400. This guy is happy because he only had to pay $400 for the tires and everybody's happy. This guy is happy because he has new tires for his car. And this company is happy because now they made $100 in profits, right? Because they only have $300 in production costs. And then they added $100 hundred dollars to the uh, to the profits but look next to the plant here we have a, a family and this family has a small child and this child has been affected by the pollution so the family has to take this child to the doctor so they can have I don't know some allergy shots and the company the, the family is spending medic in, in medical procedures or medication let's say the company they are spending a hundred dollars a month so then these guys are spending $1,200 for the child to be good, to be healthy. Now, why are they spending $1,200? Well, they're spending $1,200 because this company right here, this company right here is creating an externality. It's creating a cost to the company. 
So then what is the role of the government? Well, the role of the government is to try to internalize the externality, which simply means the government will tell the company, look, you cannot do that. You have to install filters to stop pollution. And if we force the company to install filters to reduce pollution, what's going to happen to the production cost? The production cost is going to go up, right? And now the price of the tires is going to go up. So then this guy is going to have to pay the real cost of production. So that way, these individuals over here don't have to be carrying the burden, the burden of, of, uh, of production. See, so the problem is that many companies only take into consideration their private cost. So a company, you remember, a company produce, the, de the demand, a company produce, you know, where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue, something like this, right? In other words, the companies are only looking at their cost. But we force the company to actually pay for the damage they are creating to the environment, then the cost of production is going to increase. So as you can see, it's going to change this way. So now the company is going to produce less quantities than before. So productivity will decrease if we force companies to actually carry the cost of pollution. So then what I'm trying to tell you is this. From an economic point of view, we are not scientists. I cannot tell you what is good, what is bad. What I can tell you is once you decide to do something, I can tell you which one is the most efficient method. And you always, remember this in economics, you always make a decision as long as the marginal benefit, if the marginal benefit, uh, hold on, I think it took me. Okay. As long as the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, then it makes sense for you to do it. But if the marginal cost is higher than the marginal benefit, then it is stupid for you to do it. Look, if it's going to cost you $200 to implement some type of pollution control, and the benefit that you're going to get is $350, will it make sense for you to do that? And the answer is yes, because the cost is only 200 and the benefit is 350. How about if the cost is 300? Yes, because your cost is 300 and the benefit is 350. How about if it's 325? Yes. How about if it's 350? Well, at that point you say, okay, I'm actually getting absolutely not a lot of benefit, but my cost is equal to my benefit, so why not? But if it's gonna cost you 380, and you're only gonna get 350, then it will be stupid for you to do that. So an economist simply say, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. A cost benefit analysis. As long as the benefit is higher, you will do it. But once the cost become higher, then you don't do that. It doesn't make absolutely no sense. And this is how pollution behave, guys. See, look. This is cost, and this is the quantity of pollution. I'm going to make a little graph like this. Now, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. No, this is, let's say, millions of tons of pollution into the environment. Now, if we want to reduce pollution, we're going to have to spend a lot of money. So then the cost of pollution abatement or reduction of pollution looks something like this, which simply means that if we want zero units of pollution, we're going to have to spend real money. But if we only spend a little bit less, well, we're going to have a little bit of pollution. And if we don't have, we spend nothing on pollution control, then we're going to have humongous amount of pollution. So it simply means that the less pollution we want, the more we're going to have to spend in reducing pollution. Right? So I just call this my marginal cost. It's the cost of reducing pollution. It's the cost of reducing pollution. Now, look at the impact of pollution in the, in the environment, and then I'll put the both graphs together. Let's assume that one of you uh, decide to open a, a company, and you open that company in a small island. You go to the Pacific, you fall in love with the Pacific, you purchase an island, and you open a small manufacturing plant. As you begin producing more and more and more and more, you're going to start putting some waste into the environment. 
Well, because you are the only company, probably the environment is going to be able to absorb your pollution. So at the beginning, you produce, nothing happened to the environment. This is pollution. So this is the quantity of pollution, and this is the cost of pollution. In other words, the cost that society is paying. With the more you produce, the costs become higher and higher because you're destroying the environment, and then eventually, boom, it goes like this, which simply means once you pass this point, let's say Q1, it doesn't really matter how much pollution you put in the environment. Everybody's already dead. Right? So at the beginning, production has no impact on the environment, but as you begin to produce more and more, then it begins to have some negative impacts, and then eventually it becomes a dramatic impact. Right? So this is the cost to society. If we allow pollution, right? If we allow pollution to take place. Now, the other line that I gave you is the cost of reducing pollution. We just call this the benefit that we're going to receive if we receive, if we, um, well, it's actually the, 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 the cost. This is actually the cost of reducing pollution, right? This is the cost of society. It's also at the same time, it represents the benefit that we receive if we, if we have pollution at that level. Let me see if I can explain this this way. Look at this. Let's say 10 units of pollution. At 10 units of pollution, we are spending this amount of money, right? This amount of money in reducing pollution. Let's say $10 billion. But this is the benefit that we are receiving only. Okay? I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is the, yeah, this is the, the benefit that we are receiving. So as you can see, at this level of pollution, at this level of pollution, we are spending too much money in keeping pollution at such a small level. See, the cost of reducing pollution is higher than the benefit we are receiving. Now, at this point, they are equal, but now look right here. Look at this point. Let's say at 30 units of pollutants. At 30 units of pollutants, this is the cost of society. Because pollution is increasing. And this is how much money we're spending in reducing pollution. Which simply means we are not spending enough money to try to reduce pollution. So then the question is, so what is the optimal level of pollution? Those pollution supposed to be zero? Or those pollution supposed to be very big? And the answer is no. Pollution to take, supposed to take place up to the point in which the cost that pollution is causing to society is equal to the benefit that we are receiving by allowing pollution to be at that point. And again, guys, this is this is theoretical theoretical uh, lesson. It's a, a little bit of theory. Look, I already told you that pollution is a byproduct of production. So then, if we are producing, we are polluting. But if we are producing, we are creating jobs. So we have a benefit. Producing creates a benefit because it creates jobs. But producing also creates a cost that is destroying the environment. So then the question is, you have to weigh the cost that we're getting by destroying the environment and the benefit that we're getting by having people employed. Right? If the cost or destroying the environment is higher than the actual benefit, then we are doing something wrong. But as long as they become equal, then we are okay. Questions? Okay. And again, this is just a, this is just a concept. It's just a concept. Okay. So, if we decide to do nothing about pollution, we're going to pay a high cost, right? There's a high cost of doing nothing. And what is the cost if we decide not to do nothing about pollution? Well, we're gonna have environmental degradation, uh, temperatures in the climate, right? And then what is the cost of doing something? Well, the cost of doing something is the cost that you're actually going to pay. As you already know, we have different types of pollution. We have smoke pollution, acid 
rain pollution, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and all this type of pollution. We have organic pollution, we throw waste in the trash, we have thermal pollution, when we change the temperature of the water, right? We have solid waste pollution. So there are different types of pollution, right? And a lot of pollution come from people just like me and you. Just, you know, the trash that we throw every Monday, you know, when the trash person comes to your house. See, but we put a little bit of waste in the environment, but when you multiply that by billions of people, then it becomes a very serious problem. The majority of the solid waste that takes place in the, nation, in the world is actually as a result of agriculture and mining. See, agriculture and mining is the one that actually create most of the pollution. The question is, so why do people throw trash, for example, like me and you? How many times you have been driving and you, know, and you have a piece of gum in your mouth and you, you look around to see there's nobody there and then eh, you open the window, poof, you spit the gum outside your window. Am I the only one that have done that? Have you ever spit the gum outside your window? Yes. Why do you do it? Why do you do that? Or why do you do that? I mean, I have done that many times. I even teach my kids, no, I have a gum, I want to throw it away. I say, okay, just wait. I'll tell you when. Let's see nobody's behind us. Okay, I'm going to lower the window and you spit it out. Okay, that too. So my little kids already know that they can spit a gum out of the window as long as nobody wash you. I mean, why do we do that? Because it's convenient. Because it's convenient. I mean, how many of you have gone to school, you know, have an apple and you wait to school and then you finish your apple and you roll the window, you throw the core. You say, it's no big deal, it's biodegradable. Right, or you throw the banana peels out of your window, right? And some people just throw bottles. So then the question is, why do people pollute? And what's the answer? Because it's convenient, it's cheaper. The same thing with companies. Why do companies pollute? Because it's cheaper. Because they don't have to pay for the recycle. They don't have to pay for the collection. They don't have to pay for the, taking all these to the dumpster, okay? So again, we're trying to understand the economic reasoning of why people pollute, right? So then the reality is that a waste product is the result of inefficient production, right? It's a waste of inefficient production. So like I told you at the beginning, in many cases, people pollute because the environment has no ownerships. And I don't care about what happened to something that is not mine. So then if we want to do something serious about pollution, we need to assess the damage done by pollution, then assign rights to individuals, for these individuals to determine if they're going to allow it or not. Is it possible to eliminate pollution to zero? Well, according to the EPAs, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, we already have technology to reduce pollution to zero. Why we don't do it? Well, because it's too expensive. And companies are not going to spend money on something for which they are not going to get a return. So by installing very expensive filters in my production, I'm not gonna get no return. All I get is a feeling of goodwill from my part. I'm doing something good. You know, but companies are not in the business of doing something good. Companies are in the business of making a profit. And the easiest way to make a profit is very simple. Reduce your cost of production. And the easiest way to reduce my cost of production is by throwing my waste down the river instead of paying somebody to go take it to a dedicated place. Right? So again, companies always want to maximize they always want to maximize the profits, right? And you already know that the profit maximizing decision can mean that in some cases, pollution is going to take place. So then to reduce pollution, the company has to change that offending input or that process, right? So again, the problem is that companies, they only look at their cost. They only look at the private cost. How much did it cost me to make this? They don't look at the external cost. 
and what's an external cost? Is if a third party suffers a cost due to these private decisions, these are called external costs. The example that I gave you. Um, any of you have traveled right here to Charleston, outside Cleveland? There's a bull water plant. Has anybody traveled north of, Cle of Cleveland? Are you traveling north of Cleveland? There's a, a, a paper mill outside in Charleston, Tennessee. And when you drive by there, it's a, ah, I mean, horrible smell, horrible, horrible. I mean, it smell like caca, period, right? So now, the people that own properties next to that plant, right, have difficulty selling their properties. Because who wants to move into a place that once in a while it smells like caca? You don't want to go there. So then, as you can see, then the companies have taken, have stolen some of their profits. So this people that own property around the company simply because the companies they're producing is creating a very negative externality, a very negative externality, okay? So then what we're supposed to do is force the company to add the external cost. Look at this. In this case, the company produced for marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Remember, perfect competitive company. And it's going to produce a point B. But the problem is that the company is only using their private costs. But actually, society is also paying some price for that production. So if we force the company to pay for that cost, then they're going to have a total cost that includes not only the private, but also the external cost. And as you can see, then companies are going to be forced to produce less. OK? So how do we control pollution now? What is the methods that we're presently using? In the United States, the number one method we use to control pollution is the command and control approach. The command and control approach, simply the government comes to you and tells you, this is what you need to do. And then they control you. This is the number one way we control pollution in the United States. Now, the command and control approach has a couple of very serious problems. And the serious problem that it has is that it does not create any incentives for a company to find better ways. It'll be like this. The government comes, I'm the EPA, I come to Chen, Chen, Chen Harris. He come to Harris and say, okay, Harris, this is the type of filters you have to use in the production of whatever you are producing. I'm the EPA. So Shane goes out and paid $20,000 for these filters in his company, right? Now, Shane realized that in Germany, companies like his are using different type of emission controls. And they're actually cheaper. And he comes to me and say, hey, can I use these filters that they sell in Germany? I will come back to him and say, no, you're going to use those filters because those filters have not been approved by the EPA. So said, then you have no incentives to find better methods because you have to comply to whatever I told you. That's the command and control approach. Okay? And this is the number one method we use to control pollution in the United States. Right? Another method is what the market creates. It's called market-based incentives. That simply means that some people buy products from companies that they are environmentally friendly. Some people I don't know, what do we call it? We call him three huggers. I mean, some people, I don't know, Harris, Pearson, help me, are you one of those guys that you really care for the environment and you're willing to pay an extra penny or an extra cent for something because it comes from a clean company? I mean, there's some people like that. that really, they, you really right? don't notice it, I guess, if it's a small increase. Exactly, if it's a small increase, you're willing to pay it, right? And that's why people say, yeah, if it's a small increase, I'll pay it. Well, let me tell up you this. To a, up to a certain point. What is the point, sir? Three cents, five cents? <laughs> okay. A couple of years ago, the EPA was forcing companies, well, not forcing, giving the option to use a new technology to capture the, uh, the fuel. You know, when you put gas on your car, there's some fuels that comes out, the vapors, fuel vapors. And I don't know if you remember this, but about six, seven years ago, when you used to go to a gasoline station and you put the nozzle in to put gas, there was like a little cone. And the cone was almost like a little vacuum. 
and it, it will soak the fumes and recycle back into the what? Into the tank. So not to put gasoline vapors into the environment. And the, com the government said, this is a good technology that we're going to implement nationwide. Well, let's go ahead and test it to see if it really works. So it gives the option to some people to test it. So some gasoline stations put those new pumps, especially the new, new, new stations that were being built. So now, as a result of that new, I guess, expenditure, the price of gasoline went for about three cents per gallon. So on a typical corner, on a typical corner, we have a gasoline that was being sold for 265. And across the street, we have this, another new gasoline station and they were charging 270. So the individual will come to the corner and it's 265 or 269. And guess where individuals went to? To the 265. So individuals were not even, even willing to pay four cents to save the environment. So as a result of that, the government decided not to implement that technology. See, because people don't care about the environment. People care about themselves. Look, I'm the nicest guy that I know. I don't know nobody nicer than me. I'm the, I mean, I care, I mean, sarcastic guys, okay? So show me a little laugh there. Okay, I'm the nicest guy that I know, okay? I like tuna, I like tuna. Right, I used to eat a lot of tuna sandwich and you know tuna and the grill and things like that. A couple of years ago, a lot of young people like you, they're I call them tree huggers, begin to complain against the tuna industry because these fishermen will go out into the ocean and get tuna, and they'll put these humongous three mile long nets and they begin to circle it and they to to get the tuna, but the dolphins tend to swim with tunas. So every time the fishermen would go out there, hundreds of dolphins were dying as a result of tuna fishermen. So a lot of people begin to say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. We need to force these fishermen to actually put dolphin safe nets. Nets that will allow dolphins to be able to jump and don't get caught with the tunas because they swim together. There was so much pressure in the fishery industry that they agree and they implement this new technology and they can go down to the ocean and get humongous quantities of tuna and very few dolphins are actually caught on the net now. Now everybody's happy. Is everybody happy? No, I am not happy. Why am I not happy? Because the price of tuna went up. Why did the price of tuna went up? Because people like you care about dolphins. Do I care about dolphins? Who cares about dolphins? Well, Mr. Hansel, uh, how about if, if all the dolphins of the ocean die? So what? We can see them on the aquarium. Well, how about if they become extinct, Mr. Hansel? How about if they all die, period? Okay. We used to have dinosaurs. Do you miss them? It's my joke. That simply say that in many cases, People really love one thing, but not everybody agrees on that. Does that make sense? So then why does pollution take place? Because nobody agrees on what needs to be done, right? So another way in which we actually trying to control pollution is by internalizing the cost. And I already told you what that means. It's by forcing companies to pay for the actual cost of whatever they're doing. So we put all the cost of production back into the companies, okay? And if we do that, for example, think about this. Remember, this is the company will still producing for marginal cost because marginal revenue. They'll produce a thousand units. But if we force them to put pollution control system, the cost of production is going to go up, it becomes higher, the marginal cost becomes higher, and now the company is gonna be forced to actually produce less than before because now they're paying for the actual cost of production, okay? Something else that we are doing to try to control pollution is just simply creating a fee, an emission charge, that we just charge people X amount of money based on the amount of quantities of pollution they are putting into the environment. Right? In some states, you know, companies have to pay, pay emission charges. 
the state of California, for example, okay? So in other cases, we are forcing companies to be involved in some type of recycling, right? But again, a company is not going to be involved in recycling unless this is going to allow them to save money. But recycling is actually expensive. And that's why companies don't do it, right? Something else that we're trying to do is to increase the price of the item by imposing a tax. So then the users of that product will consume less, and that means there will be less production and less emission or less pollution. For example, the fee that we have on gasoline tax. The more gasoline you consume, the more amount of taxes you're going to pay. And by putting that tax expensive, then people are going to be incentivized to actually drive less, okay? Another way in which we are reducing pollution is by putting green taxes. In other words, a tax on activities that cause pollution. Uh, for example, I don't know if this is kind of interesting. Anybody know which one is the number one pollutant of, um, what is it called, Those, the ozone layer, the hole that we're creating in the ozone? Remember the, the, the cans of spray that people used to use? That the, that oh, the aerosol. The aerosol, okay. So that was creating aerosol. aerosol, right? So that was creating holes on the ozone. And now that's why they are illegal now. They have to try to control that, right? Do you know which one is the number one contaminant in the environment that actually is creating holes on the environment in, in the ozone layer? Is cows, cows, every time they fart and they fart a lot, they put methane gas into the environment. And the methane gas is actually going to the atmosphere and it's actually destroying the ozone layer. The ozone layer is a real thin protection that we have from the sun rays. So then we know that people like you and me that like to eat meat are making a contribution to the destruction of the ozone layer. So that's why some nations like in Norway Farmers now pay a tax for every cow they have. So you have cows, you're destroying the environment because the cows are farting, and you have to pay X amount of dollars per year. Wouldn't eating them help though? Well, eating, yeah, eating the cows will help because we are we're decreasing the supply. But the problem is that when people begin to eat cows, like me and you, the like state, right, then the farmer has a bigger incentive to produce more what? to raise more cows. Think about this, the number one reason why the Amazon, the Amazon forest or rainforest is being destroyed is because of people like you and, you, you and me, that they are meat eat eaters. Do you know that? It's people like you and me, the one that is causing the Amazons to be destroyed. What happened is in Brazil, the farmers are literally burning the forest to be able to clear the land so they can have more cattle, right? So that's why some nations now, they say, okay, I think Norway is the first one that actually is charging a tax on farmers that have cows, right? And the reason is make the price of meat more expensive, make the price of meat more expensive, then people will consume less, and then farmers have a, a smaller incentive to continue producing or raising more cows. Okay, so that's green taxes. Another way we are dealing with pollution is by just simply fining those people that pollute, a pollution fine, right? We find you to be able to do the cleanup. Now, something that is very, also very interesting in the United States, in the United States, we have created tradable pollution permits. And let me tell you what tradable pollution permits are. It goes something like this, okay? Let me see if I can go right here. The government looks at a geographical area, for example, the state of California, look at the state of California. It's okay, this is the state of California. And we have, let's say, six companies that are polluting, I don't know, carbon monoxide, I don't know, right? So we have company one, two, three, four, okay. We have five companies that emit high amounts of, of carbon monoxide. 
and the government will say, we are not going to allow more than, let's say, 500,000 units of carbon monoxide into the environment. That's all we're going to allow. In the state of California, no more than 500,000 tons of carbon monoxide. So then the government create permits for up to 100,000. And then the government allocates this to different companies. So company one can produce, a, can contaminate 100,000. The same thing with no company three and company four and company five, all of them are able to pollute up to 100,000. So as you can see, we achieved the goal of keeping pollution at 500,000 units of pollution. That's it. But now if company one is very efficient and they don't need that permit, then they can use this permit and sell it to someone else. So if another company over here wants to produce more, right, they can buy the permit from the other company and they're able to increase the pollution to whatever permits they have. That's pollution permits. The irony of this method is this. Some companies, some companies in the United States make more money by selling the permits than by the production revenue they get or producing whatever they are producing. Think about that for a second. Some companies make more money by selling the pollution permits and produce nothing than by producing. So what that means is that the government is failing because the government is giving a pollution permit to a company that do not need that permit. It's like an extra bonus, right? an extra check. So that's the complaint that we have about using pollution permits or tradable pollution permits to try to control pollution, but we are doing that in the United States, okay? Uh, what else? I already told you about command and control approach. I told you the problem with the command and control approach is that companies have to comply with the law. They have no incentive to innovate and the regulatory practices are so rigid that the companies are not able to implement changes of technology, okay? So then the question is, do we have a cost of reducing pollution or not reducing pollution? And the answer is yes. So then the question is, what is the optimal rate of pollution? What is the optimal rate of pollution? And it's very simple. The optimal rate is not zero pollution. That's not what we want. We don't want to reduce pollution to zero. But the optimal rate of pollution is where the marginal benefit of pollution is equal to the marginal cost of reducing pollution. See, when the benefit of pollution, reduction, is equal to the cost of reducing pollution. Right? And this is the end of the chapter, guys. This is the end of the, of the this is the end, yeah, this is the end of the chapter. Okay. So um, 